I think we're live now and we have one uh, feed, right? Can everybody hear me? Yes. Good. So now that we've worked out all of our technical difficulties, we'd like to say good morning once again, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you for your patience as our technology was a little confusing this morning, but you are in the right place. This is the Community Dialogue, and we are here with a distinguished panel this morning to discuss, to discuss destigmatizing mental health in the workplace primarily, but we may visit other areas of that, that topic as well. But before we get started, and before we introduce our panel, I would like to start stop and recognize Kaiser Permanente, who makes this um, monthly monthly broadcast possible live on Facebook and with a Zoom audience as well. So thank you, Kaiser Permanente. We appreciate all that you do in the community and all that you do with support of the chamber and the community dialogue. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator, who is Judy McMurtry. Judy is an entrepreneur, business owner, and CEO in the Henry County region, um, as well as um, I think she has global customers as well. Thank you, Judy, for being our moderator and also the chair of our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee here at the Henry County Chamber of Commerce. And we meet monthly. If you're a member of the chamber, you're welcome to join us at our meetings to discuss DEI and in the workplace and, and help us determine how we can move that initiative forward. So Judy, if you will, I'm going to step aside away from the camera and give way to you and our distinguished panel. If you would take it away, introduce our panel. We'll see you on the other side. Okay, thank you, Barbara. I appreciate you. Okay, so we have two wonderful, successful women with us today. Um, first, we have Laura Whitaker Short. And Laura, I, I'm going to ask you to give us a quick, you know, that um, elevator speech, like 60 minutes to introduce yourself real quick and tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, hello everyone. Thanks, Judy. My name's Laura Whitaker Short and I'm a resident of Henry County. I live in Locust Grove with my beautiful family and I have more than 25 years um, marketing experience in the behavioral health space. Um, I've had the honor of building many behavioral health programs throughout Atlanta and middle Georgia, as well as in New Jersey. And I'm also a behavioral health advocate. So this subject is very, very um, near and dear to my heart. And I'm really excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Welcome and thank you. Okay, so next we have, okay, I don't want to hurt your name so much, Miss Glendora. Can you please pronounce your last name for me and give that elevator speech, if you don't mind? Okay. Hey, everyone. What up, though? Hey, I am Glendora Devine. I'm a licensed professional counselor. I am board certified in telemental health. I am a business coach to mental health clinicians, and I have been in Henry County since 2010 with my private practice, Divine Systems Georgia Behavior and Mental Services. Yes. Yes. And you also have uh, an event coming up. Yes. So the event is called Laugh Out Loud Therapy, and it's all about re, um, just looking a bit innovative and in how we look at therapy. And so I'm really glad that we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, because this is how we can actually break the stigma about it. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. So ladies, are you ready to get into this? Um, this is a very important topic. And after COVID, it has really increased, and not just awareness for us that it's been out there for quite a while, I know, as far as mental health and um, concerns that we have. It's also have been kind of magnified as we were closed in a little bit, well, a lot with COVID for almost two years, just about two years. So to, um, let me know um, what area, let's see, I have a good question for you to answer. Why is it important to understand the connection between mental health and DEI? Why is it important? Can one of you take that question? Well, actually both. One, start with you, uh, Glendora, and then um, can you follow up to Laura with that question? So why is it important to understand the connection between mental health and DEI? Well, I like to start off with a quote 
um, the stigma of mental health is in the same category as racism and sexism. It mm -hmm. permeates all of the uh, all of society and affects people on all levels. And that's Patrick W. Corrigan, SID in Illinois Institute of Technology. Stigma arises basically because of the negative attitude and the negative beliefs. So that's why it's really correlated with DEI because of it also can become internalized stigma. Basically, when we start to believe negative messages or uh, stereotypes about ourselves because of who we are associating ourselves with or where we are working in the workplace. You know, in the workplace, when we think about people with mental illnesses, we think about them being very dangerous and unpredictable when in actuality, they are the ones who are likely to be attacked and are likely to harm themselves instead of other people. Okay, thank you. Lauren? To piggyback to that, it's especially important because um, as our community, especially Henry County, continues to become more diverse, mm -hmm. we really need to talk about destigmatizing um, behavioral health because in the minority communities, these groups are often marginalized and they tend to hold back from seeking help because of stigma, um, because in most communities of color, um, behavioral health is something that's kind of taboo. People don't wanna talk about it and people are not encouraged to get help. So that's why it's important um, for companies to recognize this as their workforces become more diverse. This mm -hmm. is part of diversity and inclusion. And this is a subject that will continue to come up and um, organizations need to come up with realistic ways to manage it. Okay, so uh, piggybacking off with what you both shared, which was excellent information for us, um, how does it impact the workforce with the mental health issue? And how is it um, actually, is it increasing the impact of the workforce in a negative way? And what can companies do to um, actually um, counteract that or improve their work environment in that area? Okay, I'm gonna say in 2013, we had 28 million people identify that needed mental health treatment in the workplace. And out of the 28 million, one out of 10 actually sought off treatment. Now, the reason why is because of the discrimination, marginalization, and stereotyping. Not only that, but the lack of represent representation of cultures when people go to seek treatment. According to Atlanta, I'm sorry, American Psychological Association, there are 80% of mental health therapists are white. The last 20%, only three to 4% are black. Mm -hmm. So not having the actual representation and wanting to go speak to an actual therapist because they do not look like you on top of feeling dis um, discriminated against mm -hmm. is pretty much why it's not um, on the rise because we're not really visible as resources out there and the company's gotta do better to try and show that we are out there as well as the mental health clinicians that are black gotta become more visible. Okay, so what would you recommend? How would, you know, if we wanna offer some suggestions to businesses, how do we um, help to identify um, clinicians that are a minority? Um, well, far as the identifying the business, I'm gonna let Laura handle that. I have tackled more of what the employees can do to okay. get more help. So Laura, please take it away. Well, I, <laughs> one of the things that employers can do is really treat their employees as a whole person. Um, it's mm -hmm. interesting um, when we have medical issues such as with heart or with other medical issues, we're encouraged in our workforces to get the help that we need, but that same parity is not there when it comes to behavioral health. Um, behavioral health is a subject from what I have experienced in marketing to larger organizations that they're very afraid of because they just don't, they don't really have the skills they feel to really help their um, employees um, to manage these challenges. And so what that does um, in the workforce is it's, it can cause um, a loss in productivity because mm -hmm. people are not able to be their, their themselves or get the help that they need um, to be successful at work. It also affects the 
the wellness of the person, the, their health overall. There's many studies out there that shows that there's a direct correlation, correlation between mental health and physical health. They have seen that when people are able to get the help that they need for their mental health needs or behavioral health needs, then their overall health improves. There are studies that show that behavioral health diagnoses can also exacerbate illnesses such as cancer, cardiovascular disease, other neurological challenges. So it's in the best interest of organizations to really take a, a really good deep dive and find um, reasonable um, ways to help their employees to deal with mental health. And one of the best ways they can do is by um, embracing it and reducing stigma and helping those people get um, access to the resources that they need so they could be the best employee. Okay, awesome. So, you want to say anything behind that? Go ahead. Yeah, so I was going to add, like, far as um, Department of Human Health and Services are leading in trying to break the stigma in the workplace. But what we run into is like a lot of the companies are putting the titles in there, but they still not putting the resources available, even mm -hmm. though that they are some of them are using like EAP. But the thing about EAP, and I had seen this in one of my private Facebook groups um, of full of clinicians, and they made a comment that said EAP services are just like Section 8 um, for renters. Basically, therapists really are not um, being able to be profitable using EAP services due to the, how many services are given out or um, the lack of being able to get more services added to it after the number has been given out. So, or the paperwork that we have to do in order to get paid once we complete the EAP services. So it's, we're looking at how we can actually incorporate real um, access to healthcare that actually work, that works for the healthcare provider as well as for the employer and employee. Uh, when I was looking at it far as employees, what can an employee do to help destigmatize um, mental health in the workplace? And mm -hmm. what I came up with, first of all, is to talk about it. Talk mm -hmm. about it to the employer and let the employer know, hey, I really am feeling depressed uh, for the last two weeks, or I have been really feeling um, a lot of anxiety with this new task, and really talk about it and see how the employer is going to respond, because it has been on, on a rise since COVID for more people to be more aware of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So if you go ahead and speak about it, it may make a difference and start to normalize mental health in the workplace at that point. If that mm -hmm. does not work, then it starts to start a paper trail. It starts to start documenting, documenting the experiences and the incidences that you're having and put it in writing and send it up to HR. Send it up to HR in writing. And then at that time, also seek out a mental health professional. It's that time, okay? And then once that, you have started that procedure, if you still feel like you're not getting help, then it's time to contact the EEOC, which is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commissions. Um, just in 2021, EEOC received about 8,400 char charges of individuals that was allegedly employment discrimination due to their mental health concerns. So at that point, after you have really tried to reach out to HR in writing and you have sought out mental health professional help, it's time to contact the EEOC. Wow. Well, I, speaking as a, a former leader in, a, um, in the corporate world, I had employees come to me who were either panicking about a, a nervous breakdown or they had some other emotional issues that they just needed someone to talk to. Yes, the first thing we do do is offer EAP, but when they tell me they don't want to talk to EAP, then me as a leader, I have to listen to what they have to say. Sometimes they just need to talk it out, you know, not me trying to be a medical professional or a mental health professional, but sometimes people need to talk to someone. And I used to just listen and, you know, have, just have a general conversation with them, at least to calm them down. I never did any stigma towards any kind of... Um, retaliation or it never left the room, whatever we discuss, but it helped them. And we have to be conscious of that. Sometimes they just need to listen at that moment until you can get them help, you know, and be able to talk them through and let them know it's, it's okay. Uh, we have that strong relationship. It's okay for you to seek out professional help. You know, you're not going to be retaliated against, you know, I'm a here, I'm here to support you fully in that. 
that would make them really more comfortable as well. When, on a leader point of view is what I'm giving my perspective as a leader is what I used to do because I encountered that on a um, regular basis and that was prior to COVID. So um, with that said, I have another question for you ladies. And thank you so much for participating. This is really great. So the next question I have for you is what is the stigma and is not, um, what is what is the stigma actually? I know you kind of elaborated a little bit on it, but if you can go into a little bit more depth and what is it not? Like what is the stigma and what is it not? Okay, I'm gonna start off and uh, Laura can put it about what is not. But stigma is basically when you were just speaking about um, a, ment a client, I mean, a somebody that you're working with coming up to you and they say, and I have anxiety, you know, I'm doing, I'm not feeling well about this, is you not taking on as a leader, a negative belief about what they just said, is you're, you're not taking on a negative thought pattern about the words that just came out of their mouth related to, they can't complete the task, they're feeling um, anxious, they're a little worried about how they're completing the task, is you stand in a positive light. So stigma is really negative thoughts, negative beliefs about situations and um, events. Uh, what it is not, Laura, please go ahead. <laughs> so stigma, <laughs> stigma, what it is not is just an acknowledgement that behavioral health exists and that mental illness exists. Um, companies and employers need to go a step further and they need to make sure that they have um, safe spaces in their organizations for people to be able to feel safe in, in um, speaking up to say that they're struggling because of behavioral health issues and there needs to be discipline involved if persons are heckled or picked on um, because they have behavioral health issues. Um, you know, in some workplaces, you know, there's no kind of repercussions for people making jokes about someone being crazy or someone hearing voices or things like that. Those types of behaviors should be um, penalized and they should be addressed much like if someone made a racist comment or if someone made a sexist comment. Um, so until organizations um, can put the right expectation of their um, employees in place about behavioral health and stigma, nothing will change. So it has to start at the top and there needs to be guidelines um, in employee handbooks, much like they have for, for sexism and for sexual harassment and so on. Okay, so then that'll lead us into the next question. What is the um, Equality Act of 2010? Well, the Equality Act um, of 2010 was um, a federal law that was put into place that is made it illegal to um, discriminate in the workplace related mm -hmm. to mental health illnesses. And it came under like five different categories. The first one was direct discrimination. Like they're going to directly discriminate you towards you because they know you have this mental disability. The second one is indirect discrimination is when they make arrangements that really are unfair to you due to your mental health problem. And the third one is discrimination arising based on disability. Now in counseling, I see this a lot. And this is like when you get in trouble because you have a mental illness and it's coming into play. So for mm -hmm. instance, you might have a doctor's appointment to come see your therapist and right. you get to your appointment, but although your job knew about it and they knew that you were struggling with mental health, you still got a point because you did not come to work or you got a warning because you did not come to work. But that's literally discrimination. Um, the fourth one is harassment. And we all know about bullying and being harassed on a job, especially um, this is particularly about mental health. And mm -hmm. the fourth one is victimization. And Laura spoke on that before. She was basically saying like, if you go ahead and complain, you are not supposed to get in trouble because you complain or you made a complaint to HR about what's going on in your area of the workplace and how you're feeling discriminated against based on your mental health. The American Disability Act and Section 501 Rehabilitation Act of 1973 and are federal laws that protect employees in the workplace. You are honestly protected in the workplace. You mm -hmm. must take the steps to actually get help. And the first one is to speak up. Speak up yeah. and say something. Say, I have mental illness. I have a problem. Um, these employment 
anti-discrimination laws, they cover illnesses such as anger. Anger can be an illness, you guys. Bipolar, mm -hmm. anxiety, body dysmorphia disorder. That can be an issue in your workplace and you're covered by it. It's very important that you, you all do seek out mental health um, counseling or from a professional in order to help document how your mental is actually is. A lot of people miss that step um, in the workplace. They just go, oh, well, I'm sick, or I just don't feel like it, I just don't want it, but they don't go and see a mental health professional. We are part of your healing process of not feeling like that anymore in the workplace and in your life in general. That's what I have to say. No, well, you know, that comes from, especially being African-American and a baby boomer, we were not told to, you know, mention that. We had to sweep that under the what rug. We had to keep silent. And of course, you're raising your children, and it's the same kind of concept in general. You know, me personally, I've had people in my family with mental illness, and I have um, compassion, and I definitely understand and want to do something about it because I know it's it is an issue, and I've learned, and I, you know, you do your research and you study, and you know the importance of it. And you see just in the news today, you know, your heart goes out to people who have mental illness, but not to feel um, ashamed or anything like that, but to have compassion and to help them, you know, they can go be great in life once they receive the help, you know, not just with the medical professional, but we have to embrace them as well to show that they're welcome. They're different, you know, just because they have a mental issue or health, uh, men mental concern or or men, mental um, health issue doesn't mean that anything bad about them. It just means they're different, you know, and we just have to learn to work around each other differences, no matter what it is. And that's part of the diversity, like you were mentioning as well. So with that said, so what are some of the practical ways that employers can implement stigma reduction into the, their organization? Well, I'll jump in on that. First of all, wellness needs to be more than EAP. Behavioral health wellness needs to be more than EAP and an acknowledgement of behavioral health during the months of May and September. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that's awesome that organizations want to recognize Mental Health Awareness Month in May and they want to recognize um, suicide awareness in September, but behavioral health is all year. So we need to have, or employers need to put things into place all year um, that deals with wellness. So some of the things that they can do is they can, I've seen employers that have um, meditation rooms. I know in some of our Piedmont facilities, we have meditation rooms. We call them the lavender room um, where employees can go and, and just, you know, have a minute to, to get clarity. Um, you can also introduce various types of classes or lunch and learns like yoga or give them opportunities to be able to do that with a local gym, you know, on their off time. It doesn't always have to be during, um, you know, work hours. Then mm -hmm. one of the things that I got to be a part of when I was working at Piedmont Macon is we used to offer um, behavioral health sensitivity training um, mm -hmm. to various organizations. And it's very similar to a cultural sensitivity training and they would customize mm -hmm. it to the business that they were working with. So I've seen where um, with local fire departments, they've done trainings on PTSD um, awareness and suicide um, awareness, just to have your leaders be prepared um, so that they can mm -hmm. identify when someone is in struggling before it gets to the point of crisis and then have real concrete resources in place in your community to help your employees. One of the other things that's very easy and practical for employers to do is to offer online behavioral health wellness tools that can help them with sleep or stress reduction, and then most importantly, for us to really get um, behavioral health res you know, challenges resolved in the workplace is employers really need to push insurance companies to bring behavioral health services up to the same parity, meaning they're going to be paid the same way behavioral health professionals, psychiatrists, therapists, and so on mm -hmm. will be paid the same way that um, you know, clinicians are for other um, disease states such as you know, um, neurological diseases or heart disease. Mm -hmm. And they can all work with Congress um, or with the Georgia, you know, legislature to get laws changed to make it easier for people to have access to behavioral health services. Yeah, okay. 
I mm-hmm. love that, Laura. And, you know, honestly, when COVID hit, um, the federal government did put in parities for us, and mm-hmm. which was so such a blessing because now we can get paid as mental health clinicians what we des- deserve to be paid, just like other medical um, professions in our uh, field. So that's, that was a great thing. So, um, and now since COVID has um, kind of uh, subsided, but it's still here, you guys, trust and believe, um, it's, the parodies are still in, in position. So, which made it a much better way for us to actually do, um, get, get more help and be out here to serve, uh, serve more people. And I feel like for our, as the employees, for as the employees, in order for them to, to actually get to help again reduce the stigmatism related to mental health in the workplace is to not only go to therapy, uh, seek out therapy, attend the lunch and learns, attend the wellness events, but also look for community events like Laugh Out Loud Therapy, which is a therapeutic workshop and professional comedy show. Now, the reason why that I created Laugh Out Loud Therapy was to be innovative when it comes to therapy. A lot of times, many of us cannot go to therapy more than once a week. And sometimes we need to go, we need to go twice a week. Either we can't afford it due to our time or the money that it costs, or the insurance company is not trying to allot it. So with that being said, I was thinking like, what else can we do to just bring mental health to everyone before it's a tremendous need or somebody that's trying to get more resources and they just can't get it through their therapist for that month or that week. So go to a therapeutic workshop in Henry County on the South side. Let's Mm -hmm. do it here and let's have resources for our community so we can break the, the stigmatism related to what how we're living in our community in in henry county so that's why yeah that that was created okay awesome now another thing again as a leader we didn't really have train we get training in a lot of other um compliance pieces on how to um identify any kind of racial issues or any type of other um stigma or um so what would you recommend as far as bringing awareness kind of training to leaders? Because they may not be aware of what they need to do. So what would you suggest for an employer to do for leaders in their organization? Because that's where it starts. If an employee comes to you, um, other than just say e- EAP, because if they don't want EAP, then what? You know, I like what Laura was saying earlier about um, the leader can have lunch and learn. The leader can put together the wellness group. The leader can have a therapist like myself come in to the building and actually put this in. And I'm going to say this, Henry County Water Authority, they are proactive. They are trying to reduce the stigma in the workplace related to mental health. They have a wellness program for their employees. They do hire therapists to come in and speak about mental health and wellness. Not only that, they keep a roll call. So every employee that does come in, they are checking them off and they're giving them incentives for taking care of themselves. So as a leader, um, just like Laura was saying, and Laura, just go ahead and reiterate them about what leaders can do as far as the lunch and learns and the wellness groups. Exactly. If you're a leader within your organization, I know most organizations do have some type of a wellness calendar. So you Mm -hmm. can be proactive and work with your HR partners to say, look, this is something that we're seeing a lot of in the workplace. And we need to make sure that we are able to provide resources for our employees and then proactively reach out to therapists like Ms. Devine to say, hey, can you customize something, um, you know, for our particular you know, industry, because it would be different from industry to industry. And Mm -hmm. I know a lot of organizations spend thousands of dollars a year in doing leadership training, um, cultural sensitivity training, those Mm -hmm. types of things. They may already have something in place that's just not um, being pushed down. But Mm -hmm. I would say if, if you're a leader, you can be proactive. If it doesn't exist, if it's something that you can champion throughout your organization, I would highly recommend that you do that. And then you reach out to various um, therapists and um, organizations such as NAMI. NAMI, we have a NAMI here in Henry County, um, and they're always looking for people to be champions for behavioral health, 
Um, and, and they would welcome, you know, uh, persons um, from various organizations to get involved um, with the different causes. And then because of that, they would have access to various resources that they could disseminate to their employees. So you, you said know, NAMI. What is it, NAMI? And, uh, before, I wanted to also, too, don't just put it on the leaders, too, because sometimes mm -hmm. it's the employers, you know, the employees. I mean, the employees are sitting right there and they see what's going on and they know what's going on and they can say a little bit more. They they might need to start the conversation and say, we need to put this in our workplace. We need to have a mental health place, um, a mental health um, wellness week or a month in our work. Place. I need that for me. I need that to help me with my anxiety so I can do better when I'm here. Can we just have uh, one day where we do something here? So an employee can actually start this, this, this mission and help everyone um, decrease this uh, stigma. But NAMI is the National Alliance of Mental Illness. The National okay. Alliance of Mental Illness is a really huge organization and it really helps out a lot uh, with us in the community. Um, in the mental health field, as well as the recipients, a lot of resources um, that the recipients that actually use their services. Yes, it's a very good organization to know. Okay, great. Well, I know, uh, once again, being in the corporate world for over 30, well, 40 plus years, um, I do recognize that employees like to keep that confidential, that uh, you don't, you're very rare because of the stigma associated with it. So you, it's very rare that you would get an employee to come out to one, even acknowledge that they have any type of mental situation. And when they do, they wanna keep it private. So for them to advocate for it, we have to really break down that stigma, you know, and we have to really encourage. That's why I said it had to start with leadership. It starts at the top. And if leadership does not embrace it, um, employees are not comfortable enough and they feel that other employees will um, identify them with having an issue or problem and and either not want to associate with them. You know, Sound because like you're going right back to that marginalization and the discrimination part of it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and I hear it, but at what we're doing today, we are actually destigmatizing it right now. What right. we're doing today is making them talk about it. We're giving them encouragement to say, you know what, go ahead and normalize it and tell your boss, your manager, your supervisor that you are feeling sad and you've been feeling sad consistently for the like past two weeks. And you know that your productivity has not been what it could have been because have you been, you've been feeling sad. What can you do to help me not feel sad as far as coming to work every day? And also what employers right. can do too, if you want to protect people's rights, and I, I am 100% on board with that, um, you know, with HIPAA and, and making sure we're not putting um, people's healthcare business out there. Another thing employers can do that's safe is they can send out surveys. We get mm -hmm. surveys all the time for other things. So if right. you want to see in your organization, if people are interested in behavioral health, just do a survey that's anonymous and right. you'll be surprised with the results that you get back and you can approach it from that perspective. And then you can, then you can approach someone like Ms. Devine to say, hey, we see that there's a need in our organization. What types of things we could do? Maybe you can't do a lunch and learn every, every month, but maybe you could do it four times a year. Maybe you could do it mm -hmm. once a quarter. You know what I mean? And then um, just start small and just build your way up. But there's a lot of different ways that you can really get a pulse on your employees. And you'll be able to also um, offer up the opportunity for anyone who may be a mental health advocate that might want to champion it. I mean, we have people in our organizations that have things that are near and dear to them, and they champion those throughout the year. So you could do the same within your organization. If you identify ones in your organization that really would like to champion behavioral health, then, mm -hmm. you know, find a way for them to be able to do it. Perfect. And I, I think it's very important that the employers do take responsibility to incorporate mental health in the workplace. I think it's very important for that to happen. I also sit um, and I do crisis management for some of those companies that we have in Henry County down there on 42 and Locust Grove, those plants. So when they have a crisis, somebody pass away, something like that, they'll give me a call. And it's too many times I have sat in that room and the employees can come on at, on their leisure whenever they want to, because they know I'm in the building and for them. And when they come in here, some of them will tell me, I wasn't going to come in here because I thought you were going to be white. 
I wasn't going to come in here because I didn't want nobody to think that I was crazy. And so, you know, just to actually, the company is actually normalizing mm -hmm. mental health by just having me being there and telling them, hey, your shift is from 11 to 4, I mean, 11 to 7, but in between that shift, go see that therapist that's sitting in there. So mm -hmm. just actually being active and um, being, you know, proactive to say, you know, we're going to do something because we know something happened here. We just want somebody to be here. That is, it is uh, the company's responsibility to be proactive related to mental health. Okay. So on the chamber site website, or um, do you have resources listed there where people can go or um, research any information in regards to mental health with outside of their employer? We're talking within the community. So does the Henry County Chamber, for as far as you, um, Glendora, because I know you actually are a clinician, have you placed any resources on the Henry County Chamber website, or at least to tie to your page that we can have other resources just to give information to people? Sure. Um, so one resource that I constantly try and list on there is Laugh Out Loud Therapy because it is a resource. It's where you're going right. to actually go in. So if you are a chamber member, or if you're not, just go to Henry County Chambers and look for in April for a, kind of, the next one is going to be in April. Just look in there and see um, when the next, it's April 16th, but it mm -hmm. is a resource. It's a therapeutic workshop and it's going to help you um, understand trauma a little bit better and not be stuck in it. And I just wanted to go over again the workplace, um, the workplace disorders, mental health disorders can be anger, depression, bipolar, schizophrenia. It can be body dysmorphia disorder. It can be OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. It can be hoarding. Mental health is a long, wide range of disorders. So in order for you to really know what's going on, seek a professional, look for a mental health clinician and then get more um, information related to what's really going on with you over the last 30 days, last two weeks. Okay, now how urgent is it for employees to implement a mental health uh, wellness program in the workplace? And do employees have responsibility to address mental health needs of their employees? Laura? Well, it is it is imperative that um, employers take responsibility um, and they are responsible to a certain extent because employers know that behavioral health issues happen. That's why they provide EAP services oftentimes. Um, but it is it, it can become a legal issue if a employee has identified that they have behavioral health challenges and they were actively seeking to, to get help and, and let their, their employer know what's going on. If something terrible happened, you know, they could, they could, their families could go back and say that their employer was aware of it and they mm -hmm. did nothing about it. Um, so there is some responsibility for employers to make sure that if their employees are coming and saying that they are having a challenge, they need to, to help them. The same way if they had a physical limitation or any other medical limitation and they had to have an accommodation due to that. Yes. Um, and if that's not provided, then the employee can be you know, sued for that is similar with behavioral health as well. Okay. So ladies, thank you so much. We wanna see if we have any questions. Um, see if Barbara has anything for Facebook or if um, I, I don't see any other chat. I've been kind of responding to the chats as I go along, but I was just wondering. So it's nothing so far on Facebook. So can I so, just add one more thing? Sure. Um, a lot of times uh, we overlook this too, especially African Americans, is the reality that we do have FMLA. Yes. We do have time that we can take off. Mm -hmm. We can't, you can take your time off to get your mental health back together. Correct. You know, so I really want to encourage you to look at your time. If you have FMLA time and you're feeling really stressed out, then take your time and get your mental health back together and then go back to work. Okay. So just check into that and make sure that you understand that once you have been working for a company you have a right to take your FMLA to get your mind back together. Right. 
that's that's good information to have. Anything else you'd like to that, that, um, yes. I would also uh-huh. say too, if you have employees that need to take FMLA because of that, treat it as if it's any other medical issue and do not retaliate against that employee because they're trying to do what they need to do to take care of themselves. Oftentimes I have heard that um, employees wanted to take FMLA time off to take care of their own mental health or let's not forget it, all of us have children. The, Correct. You know, our children have gone through a lot during this pandemic and they have behavioral health challenges that they need to get addressed. Well, you may have to take off so that you can help your child. As mm-hmm. an employee, as an employer and as a leader, do not retaliate against your employees and then try to find a way to push them out when they come back. Mm -hmm. Um, Because oftentimes that's another reason why behavioral health is marginalized and people are afraid to take off to help themselves because they feel like they'll be targeted. So as leaders, we should set the standard and let employees know if they need to take that time off, whether it be their FMLA, their PTO time, they're allowed to do it to take care of themselves and their families. Yes. So Anthony Short has a, um, a statement or a question for you. So he said, awesome job, ladies. As a leader at my organization, what do you recommend for leadership team when it comes to assisting his team if the, conf- if the confidence just isn't there for uh, HR? I'm sorry, Rita, one more time. So he said, as a leader at his organization, what do you recommend for the leadership team when it comes to assisting his team, if the confidence just isn't there for, for their HR. So if they may not believe in their HR, right. they're comfortable with their HR. Right. Yeah. I'm so, going to say, I'm going I'm, I'm to start off and then I'm going to let Laura piggyback, but I'm going to say it's time to bring in the third party. It's time to bring in somebody that's going to help them do games and, and teach them ways to actually merge together and break the the stagnant energy that's been in there also to start implementing the wellness plans start to in implementing self-care plans these work they work and it because it's a whole new perspective especially when you get someone who is licensed that's actually in the field they're going to teach you a whole new perspective way of thinking. And then it's all about taking action. Once you bring us in um, and we show you a way, hold your people accountable for actually taking the steps that we just taught you. Hold them accountable. Now I need Laura to really speak on that leadership part. <laughs> and I was gonna say, if there's no buy-in with your HR director, um, you as a leader on for your team, for whoever you, you're accountable for, I would recommend that you do a survey of some sort. Um, and it doesn't have to be very detailed, but just to see if there's a pulse or if there's an interest in um, doing things um, that's related to behavioral health. And you can incorporate that in your you know, morning huddles. Um, you could find different things that you can incorporate because it doesn't take a lot of time, but it has to be consistent, right? So in, you know, in order for it to be quality, it doesn't mean that it has to be a long period of time. Um, and then I think what would happen is it will become contagious because people will start to realize that your team's happier. There's more camaraderie between your team with your team. They'll you know start to realize that um, your teams are doing better productivity wise because when you're addressing people's behavioral health challenges, I can't say it enough. Um, then they, their whole well being improves. Their their mental health, their physical health. Um, you know, people get a pep in their step. And, and oftentimes employees just want to know that their employers care about right. them, that, this, that, that something that's important to me is also important to them. Absolutely. Well said, ladies. Now, uh, Shauna has a question. Shauna Hill, she said, can you all touch on business owners and mental health? It's very important. COVID and so many other factors lead to anxiety, stress, anguish, um, and so much more for business owners. It leaves their business and go, they leave their business and they go home with them. It affects their family and friends. So can you touch on it about leaders? Because we talked about employees, but we have not talked about um, leaders um, as far as, because we're putting a lot on leaders, but we got to remember they're people too. And they have the same um, type of concerns or issues that may come up with a leader or a business owner. You know, it can be the same thing. 
So um, for me, as far as I am a business owner, um, so you can say small business, but I see in my head big business. But uh, so I am a business owner. And what it is, what we're really just trying to put out here today is for as diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's a all around game plan. So even mm-hmm. as I am being a business owner, I am still being mindful of how I am interacting with other people and how I am networking networking with other people. And so with that being said, I also have to be mindful of taking time out for me and not overfilling my right. plate. Okay. So it's like, what am I doing as a business owner for the community, for my family? And what am I doing for myself as well? So right. again, the laugh out loud therapy was a way to just fill your cup up for yourself, for you not to be a business owner, for you to actually be a citizen of Henry County and come in sit and learn how to actually heal and not just keep running and running or stay stuck in some trauma or anxiety or any other mental health issue that you may be dealing with or somebody in your family dealing with. The Laugh Out Loud Therapy is all about helping you understand as educating you, informing you, and giving you the resources, the real tools to empower you to move, to do something different, to live your best life. So you have to take time out for yourself yeah. And get into places that are providing the resources like laugh out loud therapy or going to therapy period for yourself where you could just sit and you don't have to talk about business. You can just talk about the air that you breathe. Okay. And then throw business into it. But again, it's a, a way for you to just not be judged. Please take in consideration, getting a therapist and just having a different perspective or somebody to just listen to you to help you honestly continue your journey as a business owner, a true leader in our community. Okay, Laura, you wanna elaborate a little bit more? Absolutely, to piggyback onto that, um, as a business owner, it's easy to burn the candle on both ends as uh, Ms. Devine mentioned before. Um, So in order for us to put others mask on, or fill others' glasses. We have to fill our own glasses first. We have to set the example, and it's easier said than done. It's easier said than done, but we have to set the example of what good looks like when it comes to taking care of your behavioral health. You have to really give yourself permission to do it, and if it's something that you haven't been used to doing, it's going to be a challenge, but once you get started, it'll be easier to do it, so if that means that you're only going to start out with doing one one therapy session a month or one every two weeks, that's okay. Doing self-care, you know, taking care of yourself and putting your needs before the needs of your business and before the needs of your families, because oftentimes business owners are struggling. They're running their businesses and they got to go home and run their second business, which is their home. And we know that many, um, you know, of the businesses are women owned. And so we have additional (laughs) challenges that others might not have. Um, But we have to be the ones to champion, um, you know, self-awareness and have to champion putting ourselves first before we can talk to others about doing it. So we have to lead by example. Yes. Now, um, Shana says one other thing. She said good information, but regarding businesses having to close or near closing due to COVID, many had it very hard, insomnia, stress, you know, so what are some things that you recommend for that particular, just in that area? Someone who's um, sleep deprived because of the stress they have upon nearing closing the business or um, having to close their business and the pressure that they're under? Um, the first of all, I'm going to recognize, I'm going to suggest just to recognize that, you know, you are in the midst of a transition. It doesn't right. mean that it was the end. It doesn't mean that um, it your, the journey has stopped. So a lot of times when we take on the stress, we take on it because we feel like, oh, well, this is the end. I just did so much. I put so much into it. But in actuality, it's just your transition in the game of life. It's yeah. just your new journey, your new season, as people say. So then, it, so it's time for you to put it into perspective and accept it, say yes to it, and then to start organizing it. And when you organize it this time, include yourself in the plan. Include yourself to actually say, this is my time. I'm going to not, at, on Mondays at three o'clock, 
that's me in the middle of the day. That's me. I don't do anything for nobody else but me. I'm not going to work my business. It's time for you to restructure. A lot of times we run into difficulties and we figure, we start to say, oh, why is me? Instead of looking at the lessons that we're supposed to learn and how we're supposed to pivot and change and go forward. So this is an opportunity. COVID was an opportunity for you to stop, yep. restructure, mm -hmm. regroup, get in alignment with your spirit. Mm -hmm. And then start over, Absolutely. including you first, including you first. Okay, so if you are in a position and you're feeling overwhelmed and stressed out, then see a therapist. Right. On the left, I allow therapy. It's mm -hmm. a lot of therapists show up there. I want you to see us. We are out here. And the reason, again, Atlanta, I'm sorry, I keep saying Atlanta, but American Psychological Association said 80%, 80% of mental health clinicians are white. Mm -hmm. Out of the last 20%, three to 4% are Black. It is Black. Atlanta is one of the most saturated places for Black mental health therapists. Mm -hmm. At this time, in 2023, it is no need for you not, not to see one. Mm -hmm. There's no need for you not, not to see one. Mm -hmm. We can't tell your business. You're not going to be dis, um, discriminated against. Mm -hmm. The marginalization is different. We mm -hmm. understand your background. We understand right. your culture. So it's, it's now it's under time. It's time for you to literally step into your new journey as true and authentic as you possibly can be. Okay. All right. Well, we're at the top of the hour right now for, at 11 o'clock. Ladies, it's, it's a tough sub subject. It's an important subject. It's something we really need to take note of. And it's not just the government doing something about it. It's everybody doing something about it. And that's one thing we also have to look at. This is not just government fixing anything. We already know that it, that would be a challenge. Um, it's for all of us. We have to support one another, just the employees, employers. It's every last one of us taking the time out to just be kind to somebody and to listen to other people when they're in need of help and to like, you know, direct, maybe educate ourselves on the resources so we can send them to a, a clinician, you know, that would suit them or, you know, a therapist or anything else. But I appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule. And um, this was a very important topic that we really needed to discuss. And it's not the end of the discussion. We have to continue to put the awareness out there for everyone so we can improve as a society and move forward. United States need to come together. So we need to be united again and be supportive of each other. That's how we're gonna grow and innovate and move forward. So with that said, ladies, anything else? Barb, you have anything to close us out with? I think we're good, thank you. Okay, well, thank you, ladies. Thank you. And um, we'll be back next month at the fourth um, Monday of the month. Thank with you a new so much. We'll be, thank yes, you. in April. So thank you. And I'll be seeing you at your at Laugh Out Loud Therapy <laughs> in April, so April 16th. So thank you. I appreciate okay. it. And Lauren, thank you so much. You too, Glendora. Thank you, you have a lovely me. day. And thank you, everyone, for participating with us today. Thank you. All right. Bye. <laughs>